Everybody's been testifying tonight, giving such great experiences, and I certainly enjoy those things. And it seemed like that everybody had a little sense of humor to their testimony. And I might add this to mine, as a colored lady wanted to testify not long ago. She says, uh, Elder, could I testify? I said, just go ahead. And she said, I, I, I hain't what I, what I ought to be. And, and, I, and I hain't what I want to be. She said, but I ain't what I used to be, too. <laughs> so maybe it's about the way that I feel among such a group. I'm not what I ought to be or what I want to be, but I know one thing. I'm not what I used to be. And I press towards the mark of the high calling. It's so good to be here. We've had one of the finest times of fellowship with our brethren up in the Maricopa Valley this last two weeks. And I'm rather hoarse. And we have seen our Heavenly Father do great things for us. And we're just doing this to kind of get the people to praying and expecting the great climax to come doing this convention. When I heard that I was having the privilege of coming down to this chapter uh, with my good friend, Brother Tony, and I've asked three times tonight, how do you pronounce that name? And I, I just can't get it. And um, so uh, it's Tony, is that's all right. <laughs> I think we're not too far from here anyhow, are we? You know, that's kind of godly. You know, the Bible said God is without farm, so we don't have any farm. Seeing the great things that our Heavenly Father has done for us this week, we're happy to come down and share these blessings at this chapter and get to meet some brethren and new people from down here in this part of, of uh, Arizona, which we all know down here this is the capital. I've told them all weeks that Phoenix was just the outskirts of Tucson, always. And they won't believe it. But uh, we uh, welcome them into our fellowship. <laughs> this is because we're way higher. They have to look up to us, you see, up here at Tucson. And so uh, you all come on over and we go over and visit Phoenix now next week or the end of this week for this time of fellowship up there. We had a great thing to happen uh, just before I come out on this trip. I would just like to take just a few moments' time because I think it'd be worthwhile. Uh, and traveling all these years and trying to stand between the gap, and different organizations and people, the Christian businessman was a kind of a little oasis for me to believe that God made of a, a one blood all nations. And I, I believe that. I believe that his people are in all churches. If he's God at all, he's God of the whole human race. God of the creation. And he certainly can look out upon the deserts, the mountains. You can see what he loves because he expresses himself in his creation. And we can see that there is a God. And these people, uh, the full gospel businessman, when going into their chapters, speaking for them, then it gives me an opportunity to get to speak to all the different groups together. I was called, uh, uh, to what we would call it in a kind of a worldly expression, pinch hit for Dima Shakarian. You know what a what an armful that is. But I was at Cincinnati a few days ago and. Sister Shakarian, as I understand, uh, went through an operation. Brother Minor Argon, right, one of the officials, came by and said, right up to Cincinnati with me. I said, I've got hundreds of people laying here from all over the world, laying in these hospitals and rooms waiting for me to pray for them. Been waiting on interviews, maybe some as much as two or three years, waiting. And uh, they finally got in here and he said, well, just run up a few minutes with me. I said, well, what time's the breakfast? It's about 120 miles, I guess, from where I live. And um, he said, well, it starts about 8 o'clock. I said, well, I tell you, we will go up then about 4 o'clock and get there for the breakfast, and I'll hurry right back. 
And when I got up there, Brother Shakarian wasn't there, and I walked in and said, just what we were looking for. And so that night sometime, I got to come back home. During that time, there had been a Baptist minister that had just laid right on Billy's shoulder, my son, and said, you don't understand, sir. He said, my wife is dying. And he said, well, sir, uh, when Dad gets back, said, we're obligated to these people that we come, you know, in the prayer line many times going through and maybe offering a prayer. But you, it, sometimes the case goes deeper than that. The God heals on condition. And there might be something in that person's life. And I don't care how much medicine the doctor would give them, it would never get right well until that thing is cleared up. If you went into a doctor's office and told him you were sick and told him your symptoms, and he was in a hurry, he'd probably give you a little prescription with some anesthetic in it of some sort, some aspirin. The doctor is merely trying to get rid of you just at that time. Because he has not time. A real good doctor before he gave you the medicine, would diagnose that case thoroughly till he found out what was wrong, then give you the medicine. And sometimes we find people going through these prayer lines all across the nations, and they just run up and think that the Lord ought to heal them right then, but there's something maybe down in there, and we set before the Lord until he reveals that, what that is. There's something, God is a, is a reason for everything. And you've got to find the reason first. Uh, and then you can find what to work on. And this young fellow just kept persistent. And I got in the next morning around 2 o'clock. And about 5, my son called me and he said, Do you know a girl named Jean Dyer? I said, Jean Dyer? Sounds familiar. He said, she said she used to play the piano for you. Oh, I said, that isn't Dr. Dyer, the surgeon here, the famous surgeon, Lowell. So that's, that's it. Well, his daughter, Jean, is dying over at the St. Edward's Hospital, in, or St. Anthony Hospital, rather, in Loyal, and said her husband has laid right on the steps all day. Well, I said, well, I'll try to wedge it in today. He said, now, she doesn't know she's got cancer. Don't tell her. So finally, that day, when I got over to the room, a fine young lady. She had played the piano for me in the, when I was at the auditorium where I seen the uh, Brother Allen's people here tonight. Brother Allen just left that same auditorium in Louisville. That's Memorial Auditorium. And Jean Dyer was the pianist at the Church of the Open Door, the old synagogue. And so she had uh, seen some great things that the Lord God had did. She told her father... He just said, that's pure psychology. The man's only reading the mind of the people. There's, he just guessed at that. She said, Daddy, it can't be a guess every time. He said, it just can't be. Well, he said, Gene, forget that stuff. And she was engaged to a fine boy that was going to the Baptist seminary at the time. She got married and moved over to Rockford, Illinois, where this boy's home was. And somehow or another, she tried to hold on to her testimony but the boy went out in secular work and after a while got almost away from the Lord. The girl had a, a female disorder. She went home to her father. He knew she needed an operation. He found in her what is called, and I don't know the medical term of it, but because I know there's a couple doctors sitting here now, so it was called like the chocolate tumor. And it's uh, the inside, when they've taken it out, he must have spilled some of it. And it and the cells was malignant. And they sewed her up, gave her some x-ray and therapy. So when she got home, she continued on having pain and trouble. A year later, she returned for a complete hysterectomy. And when they removed the organs, they found the cancer had went up into the colon and wrapped around. There was nothing could be done. They tried x-ray again. It didn't work. So they just take her to the hospital and told her she just had a severe female trouble and trying to cure it up. And the girl was dying. Her husband knew it. So he come over and he got a hold of some of the books of mine that Jean had read. And so he began to come to the hospital reading them to her. And when we went in to pray for her, she was telling me about it. 
And I said, Gene, uh, he's a fine boy. And uh, I didn't want to let I keep the secret because I knew that, that he, she didn't know she had cancer. And so uh, two days afterwards, he was going to have a, a colostomy. So taken, before taking the girl up, well, they let me come over and pray with her. And I got her in a room, and as soon as I got there, there was an unbelieving nurse on duty. He had three nurses, three-hour shifts. And as soon as we could get rid of the nurse and get her out of the room, so a vision could happen. And we prayed with her a little while there, and I seen her. She's dark hair. She's only about 36 years old. Dark hair had turned gray. She was standing in the vision. I said, Jean, now look, I'm going to be real honest with you. I said, you've been in the meetings long enough to know that I would not tell you nothing in the name of the Lord unless it was so. And I said, now, Jean, you got cancer. She said, I suspicioned it, Brother Brown. And I said, that operation day after tomorrow is a colostomy. But don't worry. I have seen from the Lord you're going to be well. And she just rejoiced. So I went home. And the next day, they was going to a day after rather, they were going to take her for the colostomy that morning, and they had to they had to wait a few minutes after they had her prepped and so forth and ready to go. And there was she had the regular feeling that a human being should have at that time, and they take her to the bathroom, and she had a complete normal elimination. The doctor was so astounded. He checked her again. The next morning, they let it go, cancel the operation. Dr. Hume, a very fine specialist surgeon, friend of mine, was going to perform the operation. And the next morning, she had a complete normal elimination again. And her father, Dr. Dyer, called me on the phone, and between sobs, he said, Brother Branham, I've been a critic of what you're talking about. He said, but I'm a believer now. That the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob still lives. He is ever was God. He remains God. And we know that he is just as great here in Tucson as he is anywhere because he's omnipresent, omnipotent, and infinite. And we know that he can do all things. Now, to not hold you very long... Usually, I, very seldom, when I, if I was going to preach, well, I'd be sure to get you out within six hours. That's a short sermon. But I'm not going to do that tonight. I got services tomorrow night. Next night, I'm on. We're trying, fixing to go overseas again, the Lord willing, right away. I want to say to all the people here, friends, that maybe some of you I've met before, and maybe there's... Many here that I have not met before, I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus, the Son of God. May His peace ever be with you. And speaking sometime in these chapters, it kind of causes people to, like for my minister brothers here, say, somebody said to me one time, said, Billy, what are you, what are you hanging around that bunch of businessmen? I thought you was a preacher. Oh, I said, I, I am a businessman. He said, a businessman? I said, sure. I said, I, I, I didn't know that. I said, yeah, I'm a businessman. I said, what kind of business are you in? I said it fast. <laughs> I said, I'm in the um, uh, life assurance. <laughs> he said, the what? I said, the life assurance. He said, what do you mean? I said, the eternal life assurance. Uh, if any of you people would like to talk a policy over with me, I'll be glad to see you right after service. I'm, I'm uh, here for the business. Remember a friend of mine, Snyder was his name. We went to school together. And now, insurance. I've got a friend that's the insurance business. got a brother in the insurance business, but uh, I really don't have any insurance. So, uh, this Wilmer Snyder, a friend of mine, boyhood friend, came up to me not long ago and he said, Say, Billy, said, I'd like to talk to you about some insurance. I said, Now, Wilmer. <laughs> I said, I'll tell you what. 
Let's talk about hunting. <laughs> he said, uh, no, I won't talk about insurance. Well, I had to sit fast for him, too. I said, I got assurance, not insurance, assurance. <laughs> and my wife looked around at me as if to say, why, well, you little storyteller. <laughs> she knew I didn't have any insurance. And he said, um, oh, pardon me, Billy. He said, that's right, your brother is an agent I know, Jesse. And I said, well, I said, it just isn't exactly with him. He said, um, what kind of insurance do you have? And I said, um, uh, I said, I have eternal life. He said, the what? And I said, the eternal life. Well, he said, I don't believe I ever heard of that company. <laughs> I said, no, it's strange. And um, I said, here's what it is, Wilmer. I said, it's blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. He said, that's awful nice, Billy, but that won't put you out here in a graveyard. I said, but it'll get me out. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not so bothered about getting in, it's getting out. That's what I'm thinking about. Now, if you got any worry, I'll talk with you about it. <laughs> Just for a little, a little talk from the Scripture, though it be businessman, but I've identified myself as a businessman with you. And many of my minister brethren out here I've seen rise up a few moments ago. And um, so maybe sometime, the Lord willing, I'd like to get with the group and come have a good union meeting with the ministers down here. I know one little brother here, I met him a what Whittle, I believe, was his name. We were out together one time. Now, I mispronounced that, too. <laughs> he let me know that was all right. <laughs> and so, um, uh, my name is Branham, you know. Someone said to me, said, Our Brother Branham, are you any relation to Abraham? I said, his son. <laughs> <laughs> Father of nations. Um, being dead in Christ, we are Abraham's seed and heir with him according to the promise. That's the scripture. Now, I don't have the time to hold you here to preach because of Ramallah would never let you have it again. So, I remember when I first come among the Pentecostal people years ago, I, well, Mishawaka, there was two groups of them one was called PAFW, another PAJC, I believe. And they had their, their convention in the Northlands because there was segregation. And so the colored brethren could attend the meeting. I watched them all day, how peculiar, no more church matters. My, uh, I was sitting there, and we Baptists, you know, we kind of try to act kind of churchy in church. But these fellows didn't have any Baptist manners at all or any church manners. They'd run, scream, shout, get blue in the face, and... <laughs> My, my. And so I began to notice the way they were carrying on. And so he said, all ministers on the platform, every minister, no matter what denomination, come up on the platform for this evening. There's about 500 of us, 70 on the platform. And so he said, just raise up, say your name, sit down. I, I come by mine, I, I said my name, sit down, on down. After a while, they had a man that had some fine preachers that day. Oh, there's really scholars and real man. And I know I had no business up there with my seventh grade education standing before those fellows when he's going to talk on theology. But I thought, well, for this evening meeting, they'll certainly have their most foremost speaker for the evening. And so, after a while, they said, Elder, somebody was going to speak. And it's a, an old colored man came out. And he looked to be about 85 years old. And he had on one of those old long... Uh, what I, we used to call down in the South, preacher coach, you know, a kind of a swallowtail, you know, the strips up and down, a little rim of white hair around his head. And he had to lead the old fellow out, he's so old. And he got out there and tucked his text from over in Job. He said, what was you when I laid the foundation of the world? <laughs> the clown of you were the fastened, that when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. What was you? 
God talking to Job. Well, all the brethren that day have been preaching about the life of Christ and the coming of John, breaching the way between and so forth, very scholarly. But this old man didn't preach about anything was that going on down here on the earth. He took him up back under about 10 million years before the world was ever formed and brought him what was taken on in heaven and come down the horizontal rainbow. He'd done that all in about five minutes and one breath, looked like. When he got through, he jumped up in the air about three feet, looked to me like, and kicked his heels together, come clipping around there, and he had twice as much room as I got. He said, you just ain't got enough room up here for me to preach. And he sat down. I thought, that's what I need. If that'll make an old man feel like that. What would it do me if I ever found that fountain of youth? <laughs> old man, 85 years old, and could act like that. Well, my, he come out there, he's kind of holy, but I noticed when that spirit struck him, he renewed his youth like the eagle. You know? <laughs> now, over in the book of St. Luke, I would like to read just a little verse or two for just a few words here to blend in with something that been said and all together in the hymns that's been sang. And the Lord add his blessings to the reading. Um, St. Luke 19. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Behold, there was a na- man named Zacchaeus, which was a chief among the publicans. And he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus who he was and could not because of the press he was a little statue and he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him or he was to pass that way and when Jesus came to the place he looked up and saw him and said Zacchaeus make haste come down for today I must abide at thy house. It must have been an awful bad night. The little fellow hadn't slept at all. He just rolled and tossed around all night. We're all acquainted with those kinds of nights. Can't rest. Can't go to sleep. And he just rolled all night, tossing around. You know... His wife, Rebecca, she was a believer, and she was interested in her husband, who uh, had a business in Jericho, and he belonged to many societies of that day, no doubt. And Rebecca had got acquainted with a, a prophet named Jesus of Nazareth, who they claimed to be the Son of God. And she was interested in her husband meeting this man because she knew that the Jewish people had been taught that if a man was a prophet, that what he said would come to pass. But if what he said did not come to pass, then don't hear him. God had left that word to them by his prophets. That's how a prophet was identified. And the great lawgiver, Moses, he also had left the commandment, The Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall not hear this prophet will be cut off from among the people. And Rebecca was fully persuaded when she seen Jesus of Nazareth could stand and tell the persons the things that were in their heart predict things that was to happen come just exactly the way he said it. Never fail one time. And he was correctly on the word of God. She believed it. But Zacchaeus, her husband, had got mixed up. uh, Well, the real truth of it was he had never seen Jesus. And truly, that's a bad thing to try to judge a man before you hear him should never do that. Many times we are still guilty of that in this day. We hear of a man and before we even talk to him, we, we still, we done pass our opinion on him. Uh, but somebody else's opinion. And it's not a good thing. We ought to go see for ourselves. 
Like it was said one time, could any good thing come out of Nazareth? When Philip had went to see Nathaniel and found him under a tree, and he said, Come see who we found, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He said, Now could there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? He gave him one of the best uh, words that he could have given him. Come see. Don't sit home and criticize. Come see for yourself. And when he come, Jesus saw him coming up. He said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. He said, Rabbi, which means teacher, when did you know me? He said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. That was enough. <laughs> he said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel because he saw the very word that Christ, uh, Moses had said would take place. They hadn't had a prophet for 400 years. And here was a man exactly on the word. How that little woman at the well of Samaria must have felt when she came out to get some water one day. And there sat a man, a Jew. He must have looked about 50 years old, although he's only 30. His work must have brought him down when they were having the, the feast at, uh, of tabernacles. And they were all rejoicing. And Jesus cried, as it was quoted a while ago, Come unto me. So then he began to give his great lecture. And the, and the Jews said to him, uh, Do you mean you've seen uh, Abraham? And uh, you're a man not over 50 years old? Say you've seen Abraham, now we know you're mad. And the word mad there means crazy. We know you're crazy, you got a devil. He said, before Abraham was, I am. That was I am that spoke to Moses in the burning bush. And we noticed that when he was setting, he had need go by Samaria because Israel had heard the message and he was coming now to the Three races, the Jews, Gentiles, and Samaritans. Ham, Sham, and Japheth's people. And he's, the gospel must be introduced to them and to come to the city called Sychar. And there, sitting on the well and sending his disciples into the city to get food, a little woman came out. We'd call her today, well, maybe the red light, some foul name. You know what I mean. And so she seen Jesus... I mean, she never saw Jesus sitting over just an ordinary Jewish man sitting against the wall of the little well out the end of the street of the, where the city come to get their water. And this little fellow sitting there unnoticed. She came up maybe about 11 o'clock in the day to get the water, the family's water for the day. And she let down the bucket to get it. And before she could wind it up, she heard someone say, bring me a drink. She looked over and seen it was a Jew. And she might have said something like this, Sir, it's not customary for you to say such a thing. I am a Samaritan, you're a Jew. We have no, there's a segregation here. We don't have such dealings with each other. And he went to speaking. The course went on about where they should worship at Jerusalem. He said, we Jews know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. And the Horse went on for a while, and after a while he said to her, Go get your husband and come here. She said, I have no husband. said, You have said the truth. For you've had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. She said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. I see they hadn't had a prophet for 400 years since Malachi. She said, I perceive that you're a prophet. We know when Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. That would be the sign of a prophet. When Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. Jesus said, I'm he that speaks with you. She ran into the city and said, come see a man that told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the very Messiah? How that light first broke forth upon a little woman in that condition. What a, what a rebuke it was to those a priest of the temple of that day who seen him do that same thing and called him Beelzebub, a devil, unclean spirit doing these works. When the scripture so plainly of vindicating that it would be the Messiah. Now we 
Rebecca had seen all this. And she was anxious that her husband could once set where Jesus of Nazareth was. And she understood that he was to be in Jericho, her city, that day. And she got to praying for him. Now, I hope these many Rebecca's here tonight that you will pray for your husband that sometime Jesus will pass their way. And she'd prayed all night as we'd make it a drama. And, you know, when someone goes to praying for you sincerely, you, you don't get no rest. You can tell there's something is taking place. And then towards morning, we'd say Zacchaeus had a habit of getting up rather late. Because perhaps we'll say he had a restaurant and he uh, let the, his, his management and so forth take care of this business. But that morning he got up real early, groomed himself real nice and put on his best garments. And Rebecca, after praying through the night and seeing he was very restless, and listen, Rebecca, when you see your Zacchaeus getting kind of restless, just remember, God's answering prayer, you see. That's the way it happens. When you see him getting so he can't give you a good word, just remember, keep holding on. It isn't long till God's going to pass him by that way. He got real restless. When he is up, put on his best garments, and I can see Rebecca turn over and say, Zacchaeus, you're up very early this morning, my dear. Oh, yes, uh, I just, uh, <coughs> you know, I just thought I'd step out for a bit of fresh air. <laughs> he had on his mind. I couldn't get that fella off of my mind. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go down there to the gate where he comes in. And when he comes in that gate, I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. For having my wife out, these meetings and carrying on like this. I'm going to tell him what I think about him. You know, usually people build up that kind of a complex, you know, just on hearing something. So he got all groomed. He slipped down. He looked back up the house and see if there was anybody looking. And it seemed like nobody was looking. But Rebecca was watching through the crack of the window, seeing what he did. And instead of turning down towards his restaurant, he went down towards Straight Street. <laughs> You know, you usually find Jesus on straight street. <laughs> straight in your business. You want to find him? Be honest. Be sincere. Be straight with God and with man. Be straight with your neighbor. So he slips down the street because he knows he was to enter at this certain gate. He'd been delayed a bit that morning because two blind men needed healing, as the scripture tells us. And he had healed those. And when he got down to the gate where Jesus was supposed to come in, you know, the Bible said he was kind of short in stature. And when he got there, some of those great big people were standing there, and he couldn't even get a place to get up the see. It's hanging on the walls and everywhere. You know, there's something about it that when Jesus comes around, it always tracks in attention somehow. They were there ready to sing Hosanna. And they, he said, now, I'll never be noticed here and I won't be able to notice him because he'll walk perhaps in the middle of the street with a bodyguard and I won't be able to see this fellow. But I do not believe that he's a prophet because I've been taught that the days of prophecy and the days of miracles is past. You know, time hasn't changed too much since then. If God ever was God, He's still God. If He isn't, then He never was God. You can't just say He's God one time and not God the next. He doesn't get older. He can't change His mind. He's got to stay with His decisions. Therefore, you can rest assured that what He said, that He'll do. That's what Abraham believed God. Call things which are contrary as though they were, they were not. The things that seem real... What his eyes could see, but it was contrary to the Word of God, and he, he, for, he didn't even look at them. He called them as they were not, 
He believed God. He never just held on for one day. He went on down through life 25 years before Isaac was ever born. And he got stronger all the time. We today claim to be by grace and by the mercy and the adoption of but Christ, that we become the seed of Abraham and we can't trust God 24 hours. But the real seed of Abraham takes a hold of God's Word and nothing's going to move him from it. God told Abraham when he was 75 years old and Sarah was 65, he's going to have a baby. Well, they went and got all the pins and bird eye and got ready for it. That's right. Well, nothing going to stop them. They know it. The first 28 days passed. He said, how you feeling, Sarah? No different. Glory to God, we're going to have it anyhow. How do you know God said so? That settles it. The next month, how do you feel? There's no difference. Well, it's a greater miracle than ever now. It's two months late, see. 25 years. How you feeling, Sarah? No different. Glory to God, we'll have it anyhow. God said so. And then we call ourselves the seed of Abraham. What God says, God is able to perform to do what He said He would do. I can't keep my word all the time. You can't neither. But He has to, to be God. So, we find out that this man did not believe that. This little businessman of the city of Jericho. He had a great business. And he thought he was doing all right. And he had favor with the priest and with the synagogue. He had favor with the churches and the Kiwanis and, and many of the organizations of that day, as we would say. Still, that doesn't mean God yet. Prosperity never means God always. Sometimes it's vice versa. God said when he was sitting in the field, told Israel in her own blood, then she was willing to serve him. But when she got sufficient, she thought she was, then... Didn't want more to do with him. Turn their back upon him. Isaiah got that example from Uzziah, the king. Because Uzziah was a great man. As long as he kept humble before God, he never played politics. He stayed with God and God blessed him. His kingdom was next to Solomon's. But when he got self-centered, that's what's the trouble with the people today. Don't you never let that happen to this businessman's organization or you're gone to the dust like the rest of them. Whenever a people gets to a place to, to prosperity, begins to blind their eyes from the Word of God, they're on the rocks. Zion was a great man. But he tried to take the place of a preacher one day to go in and burn incense. And the high priest with scores of other priests come told him, you're not supposed to do that, you're a layman. You businessmen remember that too. We preachers have enough hard time keeping this thing straight. It's not for laymen. Laymen has their part, but the pulpit's for the minister. It's ordained. God sits in a church man for these things. And then we find out that he took the censer and went in anyhow, and God struck him with leprosy. And he died a leper. See, when we get exalted up, Zacchaeus is almost in that condition. He was prosperous. He stood in good with the rabbi. He stood in good with all the societies. So he thought if he got in some trouble, he'd get backed up. The Sanhedrin was right for him. He stands at the gate. He's going to do something. Now he's going to walk out and take this guy and tell him to his face, you're a false prophet. You're nothing to you. You're used to only taking a mental telepathy and deceiving the people. See, he never stopped to read the Word. That's where the mistakes made today. If Israel would have did that instead of doing what they did, it had been better off today. But they had to be done that way. It had to be fulfilled. Their eyes to be blinded. That we would have an opportunity. That been for that, where would we been? Notice. But when he got there... He finds out that he can't even see nothing. He can't see the street. There's just so many people gathered around everywhere. So he thinks, you know what? He's going up. They tell me, Rebecca told me that today he was going to eat it at uh, Labinsky. I hope there's no Labinsky here. But uh, his restaurant, his competitor. 
So he's going to eat over to his restaurant, perhaps. So I know to get there, we'll have to go down, turn off a straight street here down Hallelujah Avenue, we're calling it. I'm crude names, but I'll just do that to make my drama. And we have to turn the corner here off a of straight street to Hallelujah Avenue. You just keep that street long enough and you'll get on Hallelujah Avenue. Just stay straight. So he goes down quickly. He said, I'm little in statue. Groomed his little self. Pulled his beard down. See his perfume just right. His nails all polished. Stood on the corner said, I'll see him when he passes by and I'll tell him what I think of him. When he passes by. So he stands on the corner. He got to thinking, you know what? That same group will follow him. They'll be right here and they'll just, well, I'm so little, I'll never be able to see him. So I, I won't do much good standing here. I will be no better off here than I was down there. And you know believe I, what I'll do? Here's a sycamore tree standing here. So I believe I'll just get up in this sycamore tree. And then I'll be able to see him and get a good look at him when he passes by. So he'll never see me up there in a tree. And there's a limb that runs out there. And I'll just sit around that limb and watch him when he comes in view and when he goes out of view. And I'll get a good look at this fellow. And so, first thing you know, he began to try to see how high the first limb was. And it was a little out of his reach. You know, really the first step is just a little out of our reach. We have to accept it by faith. It's just a little more than the human mind can explain. You can't explain God. If you do, then He's no more accepted by faith. You have to believe Him. He that cometh to God must believe that He is. And a rewarder of those that diligently seek after Him. So we find this notable little fellow, one of the businessmen of the city, he said, now how will I get up? And perhaps maybe the garbage disposal hadn't come by that morning. And there was some cans sitting in the corner full of, uh, of uh, the carrying uh, in the city. So they, he said, if I could get a hold of that can, I could reach up and get a hold of the limb. Strange how God gets man to do things ridiculous. So, uh, but you know, if you're determined, you want to see Jesus... You'll do things ridiculous. If you're determined, you want to, you're want really sincere, you want to really know what it's all about. And that was Zacchaeus' opinion. He wanted to find out what all this was about he'd been hearing. So he says, now there's nobody around, so I'll slip over and get a hold of the garbage can and pull it out here. And get out here to the, the tree, and then I can get up on the first limb and get a up over the street when he passes by. But when he started to pull the can, it was too heavy for him to pull. He was kind of a short man, small in stature. The only thing to do then, he'd have to pack it. Now he had on his good clothes. See how the devil does? He just tries to put everything in your way. So he, he'll move everything, every doubt, every flaw that he can to keep you from seeing what's truth. He's just good at doing that. So... I got on my best clothes, he might have said. And here I, 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 I if I take hold of that garbage can, I, I'll get dirty. You know, there's some people think to sit in a meeting like this might get you a little dirty, kind of amongst the society or the celebrity of the city. But if you're really determined to see Jesus, you'll come anyhow. Amen. That's right. So there's only one thing to do. If a man is determined to see Christ, there's nothing going to stop him. So he reaches down and gets a hold of this garbage can, and here he comes. Just about the time he got it hugged up in his arms good, his competitors come around the corner, two or three of them. Said, so, well, look at Zacchaeus. <laughs> he has changed his position. He works for the city now. <laughs> I imagine his little face got awful red. <laughs> I wonder tonight if the boss would walk in and see some of you businessmen here sitting in a meeting like this. It's called Holy Rollers. I wonder if your face would, well, you're already identified, so might as well sit still now. <laughs> Zach has done had it in his arms. He done give away, and you done got in here, so you might just sit still, go on through with it. <laughs> sitting in there. He had his arm around the garbage pail. What a thing for a businessman. 
Here he comes, his face red, and I'm saying, well, what do you know, Zacchaeus? <laughs> you know, uh, it had been pretty sharp, the business hadn't. So he finds out, say, here he is now, he's working for the city. I know, I know his business is bad. Look what kind of a job he's got. He was determined to see Jesus, regardless. He had heard about it, and he wanted to know for himself. I would to God that every man would take that attitude. If you've ever heard of him, find out. He's not dead. He's alive. Just as much here in this place tonight as he was on the shores of Galilee. Lord, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. The works that I do shall you do also. That is, so then he was a false Messiah. He wasn't the, the Messiah that he's supposed to be. But if he does maintain and keep his promise, he's still God that makes himself known to the people. He'd have to do the same things he did. That's his way of doing things. He'd have to show himself the way he did then. Hebrews 13, 8, Paul speaking to the Jews. He said, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, he must be the same in principle, the same in power, the same in everything that he was. He must be the same today. Sometimes we see the works of God. I know there's hypocrisy mixed with it. When you find a bogus dollar, what does that speak to you, you businessman? Will you quit? Will you take all the money out of the bank and throw it in the, in the river because you found a bogus dollar? That bogus dollar only means that there's a real dollar it's made off of. And Pentecost is full of carnal impersonations. But what does it mean there's a real one there somewhere? It's somebody trying to impersonate something that somebody else really has. It's only a meal ticket. It's only a, a something that's genuine behind the thing that somebody's trying to impersonate. So we find Zacchaeus gets his garbage pail and his competitors going down the street laughing at him, but it didn't make any difference. He was determined to see Jesus. Then he'd have an opinion of him. We could just get that feeling among us. If we could just be determined that we're going to find out what this is all about. If it's a truth, if God be God serving. Elijah the prophet said that on top of Mount Carmel. If God be God serving, if they'll be God, serve Him. If Jesus Christ can't declare Himself just the same as He always was, then He did not raise from the dead. If we only try to get the people in upon a psychological appeal, if we can only change them from Methodist to Baptist or Baptist to Pentecostals, what is it? It's a bunch of psychology. It's right. The living God who created heavens and earth is still the same creator. He's still in principle the same God that he ever was. I'm glad I've seen God before the church got a hold of me. To know that there was such a see their fusses and the stews and whining. It's always been that way all. They had the same thing all through the scripture. But this little fellow wanted to see Jesus. And he was determined to do it. He was a businessman. And he wanted to do business right. So he, when he got determined, his wife home praying. And the prayer of Rebecca was following him. And the little fellow had to get up the tree. He had to shinny up the... I didn't mean that. <laughs> That's a southern expression, shinny. How many know about shinny up a tree? Well, how many of you Kentuckians are around here anyhow? <laughs> you had to shinny up the tree, go up the tree. And here he is sitting up there now in the tree, wiping the garbage off of his new garment, picking the splinters out of his knees and hands where he climbed the tree. But no matter what taking place, he is determined to see Jesus. And if you really hear me, if you're really determined to see him, you don't care what you have to go through with, how much criticism, what other people says, you want to see Jesus. You'll do anything to see him. You'll wait your turn. You'll do whatever you're supposed to do just so you get to see him. Trouble of it is, uh, today they're not thirsting enough. 
There's not enough thirst and hunger for the people. I believe the church ought to be a little more saltier than what it is. Salt creates a thirst. Salt's a savior if it contacts. But if the salt has lost its savior, it's henceforth good for nothing but become an organization. That's right. But you've got to have the savior in it. The savior is the salt, the strength. And when man sees Christ living in you, it'll make him thirst to be like you. It'll make him see Jesus in you. Make him see God. How do they know Moses was of God? And they know that God was with him. Now we notice, like Peter said on the day of Pentecost, about you men of Israel, how you indicted that generation for crucifying the Son of God. Said you, um, Jesus of Nazareth, a man that was approved of God among you, a vindicated of God by signs and wonders which God did through him. You've tucked the prince of life in the wicked hands of crucified. Did not Nicodemus well express all their feelings? It was a social prestige, a belonging to something that kept them from seeing. Jesus said to him, Rabbi, we know that your teacher comes from God because no man could do these signs unless God is with him. They recognized it, but because of social prestige, they was ashamed to admit it. They ought to have been like the blind man that Jesus healed. They said, This man's a sinner. He says, the strange things, you leaders of the day, and don't know where this man come from? He said, worthy a sinner or not, I don't know, but this one thing I do know. Wherein I was once blind, I can now see. That's, a, that's one thing he didn't know. Not like the positive testimony of man who stand in the midst of people and say, I know this something. Something happened to me. As I tried to say about the colored sister, I'm not what I want to be or not what I ought to be, but yet I know I'm not what I used to be. Something that took a hold of her. Zacchaeus sitting up there. What a mess he was in. Sitting up there. And you know, listen to me. Man who believed God get messes anyhow. They do things that's absolutely contrary to the run of the day. Listen to Moses. One day of sheep herder. A great warrior in Egypt. To deliver his people and it failed. Then he become a sheep herder for 40 years. A good old man settled down. Fine fella. Had a wife and baby. Zephra. Gershom. Now we notice that after God found him and he saw God in the burning bush. The next day he had his wife sitting on a mule. A child on her hip. The white beard flying, a crooked stick in his hand, leading this mule, the wind a-blowing, his bald head shining, and a hot sun going down to Egypt. Somebody say, Moses, what are you doing? I'm going down to Egypt to take over. A one-man invasion. <laughs> but he'd done it. Why? God told him to do it. That's why. See, it looked, looked crazy where the man had run from the place, and now he's going right back. That's the way people who are find God are determined to see Him. Here He sits. After a while, He got to thinking. You know, Rebecca told me this man was a prophet. I'm doubting that very much. I don't believe in it. I don't believe there is prophets at this day. If it would, my priest would have told me about it. My priest is one of God's servants, so he had told me about it. That's fine, but see... Never did the organized religion of the world ever accept a messenger from God at no time. Never did. Didn't Jesus say to him, you blind Pharisees, you garnish the tombs of the prophets and you're the one that put them in there? Which one of the prophets did the Father send that you didn't kill and put in the tomb because he showed forth the coming of the just one? There. And we find, that here he is, Sitting up there. You know what? I hope this drama doesn't sound ridiculous, but I'm going to think he said, now wait a minute. If that fellow would happen to see me sitting up here on this limb, and he sat down where two limbs crossed, and was sitting there thinking it over, that's a good place to sit. Where your ways and God's ways meet. That's a good place to think it over. And I hope that every person in here that hasn't ever met him, 
and really know that you're born again of the Spirit of God that you're sitting on that limb tonight. You businessmen, I hope you're sitting where we're trying to say Zacchaeus sat. Up in the sycamore tree with the limbs where two ways met. Yours and God's. And he said, you know what I believe I'll do? I'll just pull in these leaves here and camouflage myself. He wrapped himself all up. He left himself one little window that he might look through. You know, one leaf. You could pull it down and say, I'll see him when he comes, but he'll never see me. He'll never know I'm up here. So while he sat there after a while, thinking about it, there come a noise around the corner. It's a strange thing. But everywhere God is, there seems to be a lot of noise. <laughs> it's strange, but it is. You know, Isaiah in the temple after uh, Zechariah's death, he was down there and he heard a noise. And the whole temple was rocking. The post was moved out of their places. And there was angels, seraphims there, which are cherubims, burners of the sacrifice to give the repented the right away to the altar. Those great beings beyond angels with their wings over their faces and wings over their feet and flying with two wings, crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And if an angel covers his holy face to meet God, how are we going to take a creed and cover ours with him? Go to take the blood of Jesus Christ to cover us. Then we're sons. Not a fashion of this or fashion of that, but the blood. God's always His only place to meet man for fellowship is under the shed blood or the life germ. In the old sacrifice, under the, the Mosaic law, they brought an animal, and when they broke the blood cell of this animal, the lamb, the worshiper worshipped, but the life that was in the animal could not come back upon the worshiper because it was an animal's life without a soul, and it could not come back upon the worshiper. Therefore, it only was a... A hide. It was just a place to last till a certain time. But then when the Emmanuel's vein was broke, Jesus was neither Jew nor Gentile. See, the male sect puts out the germ through the hemoglobin. And the blood cell is from the male. The female, and you Catholic people, not to disagree with you, but call her Mary, Mother of God. How could God have a mother? She was an incubator. You say, well, the, the egg come from the woman, but the egg didn't come from Mary. If the egg come from Mary, then there had to be a sensation. Look where you put God. God created both egg and blood cell. He was neither Jew nor Gentile. He was God. Nothing less. He was God manifested in flesh. Did not he say... We read in the scriptures that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He was Emmanuel. He said to me, who, he said in the scriptures, your brother, who can accuse me of sin? Where have I failed to do exactly what was written of me? Search the scriptures. You think you have eternal life in searching them? And they are they that testify of me. And if I do not the works of my father, then believe me not. But if I do the works, though you can't believe me. Believe the works that I do. For they witness who I am. Oh, what the Christian is so short today of the privilege that God gave him and of the things in the Bible. I would like to take a text from there. But time won't permit it. He heard the noise. He lazed up. He said, well, that must be them holy rollers coming. Drop the leaf down. Waited a minute. After a while, he noticed coming around the corner, there must have been a great sturdy fellow out in front. I can see him, kind of a tall-like fellow, large, straight-shouldered, about 65 years old, walking along with a stick in his hand. That must have been the one that we call, he called Simon, and give him another name of Peter, which means confession or a little stone. By 12 men around him. People running out to touch the, the rabbi as he came by. I can hear them say, don't touch the rabbi. He has been tired. He's preached all night. Virtue's gone from him. He's hoarse from speaking. Don't touch our master. He must go down now. He must have his lunch. It's time for him to eat. And please don't touch him. Stand aside, will you please, and let the rabbi through. Here he stands. And when Zacchaeus, 
or a little businessman of Jericho, when he got the first look at Jesus, he looked different from any man he'd ever seen. Let's put in a little insert here. A lady might have walked out with a little baby. Zacchaeus looks over this way to see who it is. Oh, I remember when the doctor was at the house the other day. I was standing there. When the priest was standing there also, the doctor says, The child can't live. Put it in the room and shut all the doors. Don't let no air. And here that fanatical family has heard of this false man. Calls himself a prophet of Galilee. Coming up here and bringing that baby. Why, the, the law of the city ought to get a hold of him. I'll see to that. When we meet the board, we'll find out if a man who would follow a fanatic of something like that couldn't be taken care of. He's mentally off in his mind. And I see the man run out and say, I have a dying child here, sir. Would you just let the prophet touch him? I believe that he is the prophet of God. I have seen him in other meetings and I've heard of him. And I know, no, I'm sorry, there's so many. But after a while, the little woman comes out holding the baby and the baby lifeless. Just let him touch it. That's all I want. I believe him. I believe if he'll touch my baby. We just can't do it, madam. Him way out from him yet he stops in his tracks. And then I can see Zacchaeus pull his leaf back and watch said, bring the baby here. When they brought the baby there, and his little body steaming, so hot, pulled back the covers, places his fingers up on it, and the mother standing there with her pretty Jewish eyes, and the tears streaking down her cheeks, and the father standing there with his hands in the air, believing. And he lays his finger over on the baby, and the fever left, and the little fellow jumped out of the mother's arms and went on down the street. Zacchaeus changed his mind. There must be something real about this man. But I better be careful. I better keep my leaf down so he won't see me. He's coming by this way. You can never get a true look at Jesus Christ and ever remain the same. There's something about him that's different from all other man. When you ever hear him speak, you'll be like the Roman soldiers. Never a man spoke like this. The priest spoke of something. Man's still got the same nature. We have it today. Man is always praising God for what he did do and looking forward for what he will do and ignoring what he is doing. Amen. That's just the nature of man. It's always been that nature. But a man once looked at Jesus Christ, he'll never be the same. Then see him manifested. That's the reason when you're sealed with the Holy Ghost, the seal is on both sides of the paper, both coming and going. They can see the walk, the talk, the life of Christ reflecting in, the, in his people. That was his purpose of death, that the church might continue his work. But we've conglomerated up in a bunch of everything. Now we notice, as he started going on, walking down the street, Zacchaeus raises his leaf a little higher. He wants to get a real good look at him as he passes. Now he's all covered over, camouflaged real good. And after a while, he has raised like this, look, Jesus is coming right beneath him. Just as he passed by, Jesus stopped, looked up. But Zacchaeus, make haste. Come down out of the tree. I'm going home with you for dinner today. What a difference. He knew that was a prophet that the Lord God had raised up. Not only know he was in the tree, but know what his name was. The Bible said the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the sunder of the mire of the bone, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among him. And we beheld him, the only begotten of the Father. There he was, the Word of God manifested to this Zacchaeus. Down out of the tree come, quickly to repent. Zacchaeus, businessman here tonight, remember, you cannot hide under fig leaves. He knows just exactly where you're sitting. 
He knows you. He knows who you are. He knows your name. He knows why you're here. He knows all about it. That's right. And we who have met him and know him and become his disciples, we know what he is and what he does for the people. We know that he remains the same. Zacchaeus come down in a penitent attitude. He said, If, Lord, if I have cheated any man, I'll pay it back. I take my money, I'll give to the poor. See, he had already found that pearl of great price. He had found something that was more than his business. He had found something that something that all man tries to achieve something. But if you lose eternal life, what all of your achievement done for you? The greatest treasure that a man can find is to find release. As I said in the Old Testament, when the blood cell was broke from the lamb, it could not come back upon the worshiper. Therefore, he went out with the same desire to sin. But in this case, when by faith we lay our hands upon the blood cell that was broke at Calvary, not Jewish, neither was it the blood cell of a Gentile. It was the blood of God. And when that life that come out of there brings back the life of God to us, which is eternal life. The Greek word there is used, zoe, which means God's own life. And the very life that was in Christ, which was God. The body was as man, of course. But God the Creator, who made the first man. Where did He come from if He didn't make Him? God the Creator, without the help of anything, created Adam. God the Creator made the man, Christ Jesus, His Son, in the womb of Mary. And He was Emmanuel. And when sin, not because He had to die, He laid it down. But because sin struck the spear that broke His heart, then something taken place. Life come back upon the worshiper. And what is it? Then we have no more conscious of sin, says the writer of Hebrews. The sin desire is gone. Then now we are free. Zacchaeus, when they seen Jesus climbing Golgotha to be crucified, no doubt but what the devil had always doubted him. The devil doubted him when he first saw him, when he went into the wilderness after the Holy Spirit came on him. He said, If thou be the Son of God, show us a miracle. Turn these stones into bread. That devil hasn't died yet. Show me a miracle. Jesus said it's written that man shall not live by bread alone. When they caught him over there in the yard, the devils grouped them Roman soldiers, bound his hands behind him and beat him, beat him on the back with reeds and cat and nine tails until it, to fulfill the prophecy of the prophets. For he was wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquity. The chastening of our peace upon him and with his stripes we were healed. And while he was bending over and the soldiers tied a rag around his head and hit him on the head with a reed and passed it one to another and said, if you be a prophet, tell us who hit you, we'll believe you. That mockery and the drunken spit of the soldiers upon his face. The devil said, that can't be God. That can't be even a prophet. He's a deceiver, not knowing that the Scriptures must be fulfilled. Then when we see him going up Calvary, look at him. I want this audience to get a vision of him. Let's go back 1,900 years ago for a moment and give me your attention. It's dark over Jerusalem. Why? The sacrifices is refused by Jehovah. Something's fixing to happen. As the blood's burnt on the altar, God refused it. The real sacrifice is going up the street. I can hear the bumping of something. Look down. There goes that old rugged cross under Roman capital punishment of a man that done nothing. I see a little woman run out in front and say, What has he done? But heal your sick and raise the dead. Somebody slapped her in the face and said, Would you believe that woman before you'd believe your priest? Away with such a man. Look at his coat. There's little red spots all over it in the back. As he goes further up the hill, them spots get bigger and bigger. 
After a while, they all run into one. There's something splashing against him. What is it? It's his blood. And the cross is dragging out the footprints of the barrier. I can see that bee of death come up there, buzzing around him. I'll get him now. If he was a prophet, he would have, he would have done something down there when they spit in his face. If he was a prophet, he couldn't do what he's doing now. I know that I'll get him. You know, every bee, every insect has a stinger in it. And that stinger is a bad thing. And death has a stinger in it. But God had to be made flesh. He could sting a prophet and hold him. He could sting a righteous man and hold him. He stung David and held him. But here's God. And he don't know it. This bee rises out of hell. Buzzes around him. I'll get him. But when a bee ever anchors his stinger deep enough, it pulls his stinger out of him. And when that bee of death could anchor his stinger... And a man like me or you, he could get by with it. But there was a, a body prepared. But when he anchored that stinger in Jehovah, the flesh of God created, not some sexual desire. When he anchored in that flesh, he lost his stinger. Then he has no more stinger. No wonder that great St. Paul could stand when there's building a place there to cut his head off with. He said, Oh, death, where is your stinger? Grave, where is your victory? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Oh, when a man once catches that in view, everything else is secondarily. Your business is secondarily. Everything else doesn't matter too much. You're just only going to stay here for a short time. But that's first. What will it profit a man if he loses, gains the whole world and loses his soul? Zacchaeus. Oh, Zacchaeus. Maybe it isn't Rebecca at home praying, but maybe a mother that's done past beyond the veil. Her prayers are still laying on the altar of God. If that's so, Zacchaeus, come out behind those sycamore leaves tonight. That crown of... That denominational creed that you're holding on to without the new birth. That's something that you are holding on to and you've never had any evidence that God was in it. He knows right where you're sitting. Why don't you do it? Let's bow our heads just a moment. Almighty God, the great and terrible Jehovah, who roared off of Mount Sinai, even to the people said, Let Moses speak and not God or we die. Speak tonight, our Heavenly Father, in mercy and forgiveness into the heart of the people that doesn't know you and let them know that this is the time that they are maybe hiding behind their business or maybe many businessmen, your father, that, that doesn't really know you. Maybe they do belong to church and we say nothing evil against that. But they've never been born again. They don't know really what it is. And we know that not one tittle or one jot shall in no wise ever pass from your word. You said heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall not. And you said except a man be born again. Of water and spirit, he will in no wise enter into the kingdom. I pray, Father, that you'll speak to hearts tonight, just at this time. Let men and women think seriously just at this moment, knowing that we're living in the closing hours. Israel is in her homeland, the great calendar of God. She's returning back, looking, where is the Messiah? We know that when Joseph made himself known to his brothers that he dismissed the Gentiles from the courts. His wife and children were in the palace. There must be a taking away of the Gentile. And Israel might be made known. Then there will come a time of a wailing and screaming and crying. Where did you get those scars? He said, in the hands of my friends. From the, my friends, I've got these scars in my hands. 
in the house where he was really should be accepted, when he makes himself known to Israel again, God, while the Gentiles has a chance, may they repent quickly and come to you. While we have our heads bowed, Zacchaeus, I want you to be real honest just a moment. And Rebecca's too. In this little broke up message, if there has been something speak to your heart and said, I've never received that experience of, of the Holy Spirit, the full gospel, but I'd like to have it. I want you to remember me in prayer, Brother Branham. I'm just going to raise my hand, not to you, but to God. And say, pray for me, and I'll finish the prayer remembering you. God bless you. God bless you. 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 Dozens of hands. You say, does that do any good, Brother Brennan? Certainly. Why is it? You see, science tells you that you can't raise your hand, actually, because why? The gravitation of the earth would hold your hand down, but you've got a spirit of life in you. And that life that's in you, another life came to it and said, you're wrong. And you broke the rules of science and raised that hand towards the Creator and said, remember me. He will. If you really admit that, you'll take it your word. God bless you back there. Somebody else. Now, before we close, just go to say a little word of prayer. Pray just in a moment. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Somebody else. mercies, this little hands made rising up under the Spirit, speaking forth a promise, would you, would you raise your hand if you haven't done it and say, this, that's what I'm going to ask you to do, just raise your hand, recognize yourself being wrong and you want mercy. The house is open, there is a fountain in the house of David, open for sin and uncleansedness, will you accept it tonight? Someone else before we close now. It's been 40, 50 hands go up in the building. A man, women, young and old, put up their hands. All right, God bless you, sir. All right, let us pray. Lord Jesus, I believe that these hands was raised in the deepest of sincerity. You know their objective. You know their motive of doing so. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that your divine mercy will rest upon each of them. May tonight be a changing time. May they slide down out of the tree of self-style Phariseeism. May they slide down out of the tree before Jesus Christ and say, Lord, if I did wrong, I'm willing to make it right. And from this little banquet room tonight, Father, you go home with them too. And dine with them and ever remain with them through life and all eternity. Won't you grant this as I offer my prayer to you in their behalf. You said no man can come to me except my father draws him first. And all that the father has given me will come to me. You promised that. And now, Lord God, these are gifts for trophies of grace and love. They are in your hands and no man can pluck them out. With an honest sincerity in their heart, honest confession that they have made that they want to turn from the ways of the world to the ways of God for their life. Receive them, O Lord, I ask as I intercede for them standing before your great white throne. By faith we stand there looking upon the ivory throne of God with the bloody sacrifice 
laying before us, making intercessions on our profession. Help them, Father. I present them to you as love gifts in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, each of you that raised your hand, I want to ask you to do something for me. I want you to meet some of these ministers here and tell them that you've accepted Christ as your Savior and you want to be baptized and you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and God will grant that to you. Now, I was thinking of something else, but uh, we won't have time because it's it's just about five minutes time we should close the place. But... We, we appreciate your patience and all your hands that went up. Now, I didn't know just where they were. That is everywhere. But when you raised your hand, surely you meant that. You wouldn't raise your hand just to be doing it. If you did, that's hypocrisy. Raise your hand. Don't ever do nothing unless you're really sincerely doing it. And when you make that decision and down your heart you mean that you've done it, then walk sincerely with it. God will honor you. Say, by the way, did you ever know what happened to Zacchaeus? Would you like to know what happened to him? he became a member of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Association of Jericho. <laughs> Don't you want to join too? 